Hey, Paul, will you bring them all in? Yeah. yeah. Your instruments are on. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the gathering. It's good to see you all. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start out announcements. Um, the first one is the women's tea that I know nothing about, so I brought Jessa with me. Hey, so next our Saturday, which is May 6th, uh, we have our women's tea here. Um, it'll be from 9 to 11. Um, we are encouraging that teen girls, we would love for you guys to come as well. So um, come with your mom, and if your mom can't come, we want you to come too. Um, it'll be a really sweet morning. Um, we're going to play a game. Uh, we'll have a little time for a devotional. Um, and then we're actually, something I'm really excited about is we're making a macrame uh, plant hanger. Um, so that'll be really fun. Um, and the other thing I wanted to announce really quick, um, leading up to Mother's Day, um, also, also something I'm really excited about, this is a really sweet um, outreach opportunity. Um, we bought a bunch of plants to give out to um, the moms and the Y leaders um, here um, in this facility. So we ordered like 150 plants, um, these really sweet little succulents um, with a little, we made like a little sign for them. And we're going to hand those out between 4 and 5.30, right? 4 and 5.30? Yeah. Um, this Thursday. Um, that is just the best time to catch a lot of the moms as they're picking up their kids. Um, but we need a couple of volunteers to help put them together and then also to pass them out. I think we have about two volunteers right now. So if you are free, um, I think between 3 to 5.30, or even if you can only come for an hour um, just to put them together or pass out, we'll be up here at 3 o'clock. Um, but if you are free to um, volunteer, just reach out to myself um, or Amy Ratliff, because um, we would love to get you connected and to help with that outreach. But. Thanks, Jessa. Um, yeah, and, and some of you know the last night the men met and we had a good time. Uh, it was we had uh, what was it? Unpulled pork. That's what we had. I think that's what we called it. It was really good. Uh, thanks, Matt, and thanks Raleigh for cooking. Uh, we played some games, um, charades. I think it was called fishbowl. You guys should all play it. We should play it as a church at some point. It was fun. Um, uh, my team won, by the way. It was the Team Corey, I think that's what we were called, right? Um, again, uh, it was a great time, and if you, you did make it, I want to encourage you to come to the next one. We missed you. Um, uh, the next thing is that um, there's a youth retreat coming up. It's called Super Summer. Sign-ups are happening now. So if you haven't signed up, I would, would encourage you to sign up you get before May 19th, so you have 18 days and counting. Um, it's for 7th grade to 12th grade. And um, as we talk about youth, a uh, reminder that we have youth group and kids worship this evening at 6, 6 to 7.30. The kids worship will be in here and youth group will be in the back room. So, um, and if you're new and if you're visiting, uh, it's at 6 o'clock. You're more than welcome to come. There's no entrance fee. Um, but um, as we prepare um, for, for the, the text today, I was looking through um, just the preparations and a verse stuck out to me that I'd love to read. It's a long one, but bear with me. It's Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, 
and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints. This verse just stuck out to me because the Lord has provided everything we need uh, for battle and um, the battle that we're in, and, and he's been good and faithful to us. And the book of Daniel has definitely taught us that, um, that he's prepared us and he's equipped us and with his word and with his Holy Spirit. So if you would, please pray with me. Lord, we're so grateful for your provision. We're so grateful for your love uh, and your care, your attention to detail in our lives that you've prepared um, a place for us and that you continue to walk with us each day. And uh, we pray that you would empower us with your Holy Spirit this morning. And we pray that the word would go forth in power and that it would change us, that we wouldn't, we wouldn't leave here the same people, that your word would, would change us in the way that you intend it to. And we would see, uh, see ourselves in, in the text, see our sin in the text, and then see your righteousness come and, and, and bring us, you know, our righteousness in you, Lord. And uh, I just pray for, for unity as a church. I pray that we would fellowship and we would, we would enjoy the spring season from going from winter to spring, Lord. It's such a beautiful picture of what you do and have done in our lives. And I pray that we would celebrate that together. Uh, in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Josh said the word faithfulness before he prayed, prayed there. And we're going to do a new song. It's called Promises. And uh, this song, as well as the next song, are really focused on God's faithfulness to us. Uh, and every moment and every season that he is with us, that it says in the, in the hymn we'll sing, there is no shadow of turning with thee. God is with us this morning. Um, God is there for each of us uh, with whatever we're facing, whatever uh, is going on in our lives. And so let's just uh, enter into worship together this morning with that focus, that we are thankful for his faithfulness and everything. You're the God of covenant, faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. The rising sun to the setting same, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. From age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can't do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From 
the rising sun to the setting sun, I will praise your name. Oh, great is your faithfulness to me. Sing this chorus again. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting sun, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Why put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground? My hope and firm foundation, he'll never let me down. Why oh, put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground? My hope and firm foundation, he'll never let me down. again. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the crown, my hope and firm foundation, he'll never let me down, oh, he'll never let me down, oh great is your faithfulness to me yeah, great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting sun I will praise your name oh great is your faithfulness to Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting same, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of Turning with thee, thou changest not thy compassion, they fail not as thou hast been, thou forever will be great. Thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see, all I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their 
courses above join with the nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness mercy and love great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see oh Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and the peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today a bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have need in thy end that Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And all will sing out of it, Louis, and we will cry out of
Let's cry out for you, the living God, your spirit's water to my soul. I've tasted and I've seen, come once again to me, I will draw near to you, I will draw near to you. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts, thousands elsewhere. My heart and flesh cry out. For you, the living God, your spirit's water to my soul. 
I've tasted and I've seen come once again to me. I will draw near to you. I will draw near to you. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. Better is one day. Better is one day. Better is one day. Thousands elsewhere. Better is one day. Better is one day. Better is one day. Thousands elsewhere. Thousands elsewhere. reading Psalm 46 verse 1 and it describes God as our ever-present help in time of need and the start of that verse says he's our refuge and our strength and the word for refuge there uh, when I was looking it up it said uh, the one to whom one flees well that's not how I thought that word what that word meant but when we look to God when we turn to God when he is the person we seek as a refuge when we flee to him, that's taking refuge in him. That's, that's what we're doing when we talk about uh, him being our strength, being our refuge, that we would flee to him, that he be the one we turn to, the one we flee to. Let's uh, close this time with prayer. Dear God, we are thankful. We're grateful this morning, God, that you are faithful. God, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, draw us close, we pray this morning, that we might flee to you, that we might turn to you, not to anything else, not to ourselves, not waiting, not wishing, God, but that we would pursue you. Pray in your name. May be seated, and at this time, children, you are dismissed. Ages seven and lower can head to the back. Thanks for joining us in worship. If you're a guest here, want to welcome you and uh, a special welcome to the freshman class of Karis Classical Academy. Um, they had their spring formal last night and they capped off their spring formal with joining us for worship. Isn't that great? So. They, um, they were up till four in the morning, and so if I see you guys dozing off, I'll just consider that a holy nap, okay? So it's okay, it's okay. Good to have you guys here. Um, hey, just before we start, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, next Sunday is Mother's Day. I know, isn't that great? We are going to have a great time together, honor the Lord, and honor our, our mothers among us, and the the Titus two women, um, and um, uh, also just um, a, a bit of housekeeping is that we are going to end the book of Daniel today. And um, Joe, Joe has really encouraged me over the years, um, we can say that now, over the years, um, to slow down and to reflect and to celebrate what God has done. And so uh, next Sunday, we're going to spend a good portion of our service uh, having um, an open uh, testimony time to where you can share with your church what the book of Daniel has taught you and how it's been uh, good for your heart. And so this week, would you be just praying through how you could encourage and edify and lift your church up? Um, be looking through your notes and read through Daniel again and go, Lord, how, uh, how have you worked in my life in the past 12 or so weeks? And uh, what would you have me, what would you have me share? And um, just be, we'll just be praying that next week would be a really encouraging time uh, for us all. So, um, 
Before we uh, begin, also, uh, let me encourage you. I know that uh, sometimes it's easy to get into a rhythm, um, almost like an order or a, a religious um, liturgy, where you just hop into this mode of, well, now is sermon time. All right, what's next? And then, okay, what's next after sermon? Okay, well, then what's for lunch? And then, right, you kind of just, we as, we as humans are creatures of habit. I just thought we could just pause. Um, there, there's this, this people group in the book of Acts, chapter 15, called the Bereans. And uh, Paul really distinguished them because when they heard the word, uh, the most distinguishing verb used about them is that they received it. They received God's word. And so I firmly believe that everyone here today, uh, that God has brought you here for a purpose, to receive something to receive something from God's word today. And so let's just pause. And if you haven't had a chance yet, um, let's give ourselves a chance now to go, Lord, would you teach me one thing today? I'm here. I'm willing. Even though I got up at, or I went to bed at four in the morning, my heart wants to be changed and renewed today. So let's just pause and then I'll close us in prayer. Okay, let that be your prayer. Lord, we want to receive your word. Would you teach us one thing? Lord, as we, as we are sitting under your word, we pray that it would not just be ink on a page, but it, it, would, it would jump off the page by your spirit and it would transform our hearts. It would soften our hearts. It would, it would give us a taste um, make us make us yearn for you more. Lord, where we have been, we ask for forgiveness. Lord, forgive us for, for drifting, for allowing our hearts to grow cold towards the things of you. Lord, for, for being casual or nonchalant um, about heaven and hell. For being casual about sin and its damages. Now transform us from within. We thank you for, for the fact that when your church, your people gathers and they all hear your, your, your scripture, you work miracles and you do the silent, transformative operations of our heart and we need that right now. Would you do that? Not for us and not to us, we pray, but for your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you would, uh, go ahead and open up your Bibles, your smartphones, whatever you have, to the book of Daniel, and we will be in chapter 12. This is the last chapter. This book has been so good for my heart, as I'm sure it has been for yours. And in a way, this book... Uh, functions like a fork in the road. Uh, it's like two paths. In, in, in another sense, you could, you could use the phrase, uh, it's like a tale of two cities. Uh, one city that this book talks about is the city of Babylon. It's the city that is described uh, all throughout Scripture as being totally ungodly, unworldly, a path that leads to destruction that is absolutely abhorrent to the things of God. And then if it's a tale of two cities, it's really talking about the city of God where there is the Lord, King Jesus, who's reigning, who has kingdom subjects that would be believers, Christians, people who have repented of their sin and placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Loyal subjects that are, that are hungry to learn of the things of God, that are hungry to be discipled um, by the Word and by His church. They want, they want Him is essentially their, their mark. The city of Babylon and the city of God. And essentially the question that we've like faced 
all throughout this book is, well, if, if we want to follow King Jesus, if we want like, to reflect that city, man, it's hard to do that living in modern day Babylon, isn't it? Like we look all around and it, the world is reflectant of Babylon. How do we live in a way that's pleasing to the Lord? How do we do this? And thankfully, chapter 12 closes out and it gives us such clear instruction of how to be a Christian right now in Babylon. How to follow King Jesus. Actually, today, we're going to see nine different traits. Count them up, ladies and gentlemen. Nine different traits about what it means to be a Christian. And um, I'd, I'd love these traits, in a sense, to uh, function as a carrot to you, that it would motivate you. Can you imagine if you just came to Christ and you're like so hungry to learn and grow and to be like Jesus, and the pastor stands up and goes, here's some things, here's nine things today to help you grow. This is what it looks like to be a Christian. You'd be like frothing at the mouth, excited about how to be like Jesus. Are you ready, church? Should we get into it? Let's do it. Let's do it. The title of today's sermon is Forever Citizens. Just riffing off that theme of of being a kingdom citizen in the city of heaven. And the timeless truth, so this is the sermon summarized in a sentence, is that the kingdom citizens follow the king and they grow to be like him. Kingdom citizens follow the king and grow to be like him. Today I'm going to read all of chapter 12 for us. So let your eyes find verse 1 of chapter 12. This is the word of the Lord. At that time shall rise, arise Michael, the great prince, who has charged of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Verse 3, And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward the heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard but did not understand. And then I said, O my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the end of time. Many shall pur purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. Verse 11 and from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that, is, that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. This is the word of the Lord. Well, let's start at the very beginning. Very good place to start. Number one, this is the first point of nine. Kingdom citizens 
are protected. So this is verse 1a. I'll read it again for us. It says, At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. So look at that word, at that time. So that refers to the previous chapter, chapter 11, where it discusses the reign of the Antichrist. Okay? And when this day arrives, um, Michael, the archangel, will rise up and increase his level of protection for his people. So we, um, as Christians, right now, um, all the time, we have and we can pray for protection. We pray against sickness, and we pray that um, we would uh, not get into car accidents when we're on road trips and things like that. God does protect Christians, um, but we have learned throughout this book that he doesn't, uh, Christians aren't exempt from suffering. They're not exempt from trials. Um, Christians get in car accidents. Um, this particular protection that we're talking about in this specific period of time is, is talking about the end of times. When the Antichrist comes, there is an increased level of angelic protection. So, um, in short, God promises to protect His people. He's doing it now, but there'll be a, a specially raised level um, during the last days. Um, so, be encouraged. Angels are protecting us now. We've seen that. Um, I don't know if everyone has a guardian angel. I, I don't know if I can like land on that scripturally. I think it's a nice idea. Um, but we do see in the Scriptures, verse 1 of chapter 12, that Michael is committed at the end of the time to protect God's people. Number two, uh, kingdom citizens are persecuted. Look at verse 1b. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. So again, all of us experience Troubles, trials, um, um, we have backaches, we get sick uh, after, uh, after we've been exposed to viruses, you know, after we do landscaping all day Saturday, our backs hurt in church the next day. I'm seeing some of you guys like just stretching out a little bit, right? Uh, some of us eat a bad burrito and experience the ramifications of that, right? And that, those are times of trouble. But this particular time of trouble is still coming. It's not, it's not right now. Um, I believe that the times of trouble that it's referring to is the seven years of tribul tribulation still yet to come. Um, uh, one theologian named John Lennox, uh, he wrote a book called Against the Flow, talking about how Christians um, uh, are to behave in this times of trouble. And then um, currently, right now, and he writes, uh, it is hard to get one's mind around this grim statement, talking about this verse right here, that more trouble is to come. The time of Antiochus was horrendous, as was the period around the later fall of Jerusalem. The Holocaust was horrific. But Daniel indicates that there is even a worse time to come at the end. So, the truth is that Christians will be persecuted. The heat of persecution will continue to rise um, and it will spike during this time of tribulation. And I think that doesn't come to a surprise to you, church, right? We've already seen, even in the last two, three years, uh, persecution for Christians rise. Just look at last, uh, last May. We were... Uh, uh, that was when we pulled out of Afghanistan. And just now, sur uh, stories are surfacing of Christians who um, experienced tremendous persecution um, as a result of the Taliban taking control of Afghanistan. Remember that? It wasn't too long ago. And no one's talking about it anymore. Isn't that crazy? Um, I've heard of a story of uh, Luke and Sarah. These are made up names to protect them. Um, that they're being persecuted right now. 
uh, this couple uh, got married. They came to Christ. Um, they were Muslims. Uh, their family kicked them out. Uh, they they tried to you know had to figure things out on their own. They were under um, just horrific experiences within the governments of Afghanistan and the rising and fallings of of kingdoms. And uh, and this couple has stood the test of time. They are being tremendously persecuted for having Bibles, for being a Christian, for having Christian on their on their card rather than Muslim. Uh, they're being hunted. They have to move every three days. Can you imagine that? The security that we find in our own homes. Uh, it, the, their story is that the wife is getting so good at packing up boxes that she can pack up her whole home within 24 to 36 hours. They're jumping around. Yet, they're spending their lives for Jesus Christ. Um, this particular couple has helped 483 Christians from Afghanistan um, leave to the various uh, countries surrounding and uh, around 70 or 80 to America. They have a network of Christians that they're continuing to pour their life out. It's happening right now. It's just, it just feels far away because it's on the other side of the globe. But it's true. Christians are being persecuted all over the world. And uh, I, know, I know that like when pastor dudes say that and they talk about uh, you know, persecution, they use illustrations of like people from other countries. It's so easy as Americans to be like, well, it's far away, and it's not like that's not gonna come here. But I think that over the past few years, we have seen persecution come into our own home, in our own backyards, into our churches. It is getting weirder and weirder in the world's perspective as they're looking on at us. It's getting weirder and weirder to be a Christian. Your biblical views, as you hold fast and tightly, as you're tethered to the Scriptures, will become even more abhorrent in the eyes and ears and view of the world. If you haven't felt it already, you will be greatly tested. And I know that's not a, like, a nice, warm, fuzzy message, but that will strengthen you, Church of God. That'll prepare you. It won't catch you off guard. I hope you've seen in the past 12 weeks that persecution, trials, and suffering, that God prophesies for the people of God so that you won't be surprised by it when it comes. You're not blowing it. You're not screwing up. Jesus promises it. In fact, uh, in the book of 2 Timothy, he tells that there is a time coming, and that time is now, when people will not endure sound teaching. They'll go somewhere else. They, they don't want it. They, what, what, is it. What does it say? That they'll want their ears tickled. And so they will, it says in, in chapter 4, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And they'll turn away from listening to the truth and they'll wander off in myths. Don't be surprised when people do this. The time is now. So again, you're not blowing it if persecution is happening. Actually, you're promised it and you're being tested right now. Your faith is being refined. And I promise, as you hold fast to Jesus, great fruit will come about it. Number three, kingdom citizens are secure. Kingdom citizens are secure. This is verse 1c. Let me read it for us. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Don't you love that one? All right, so this is the book talking about the book of life. We read about it in Revelation. It's also called the Lamb's Book of Life. This is, catch this, it's a great book. Every Christian from the beginning of time that is written in that book. Now, you guys think that like your family Bible is pretty big? Just like go there for a minute. Think how big that book is. It's a literal book. A lot of pages 
where if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, one day when you die and you're before him, and he'll open it up and he'll look and go, J, 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 Josh Cousins. Boom. Book of life. Come on in. How do you get in that book? If you're not a believer today and you're interested in that, which should really interest you, that's the question. How do I get in that book? I remember when I was in college, uh, one of my good buddies, we were sharing life goals together. And he shared, my, my life goal is to get into a phone book one day, right? Which only the old people laugh because no one uses phone books anymore. But um, I, I actually don't think he's made that, you know, because I don't think they have them anymore, do they? Phone books, right? Some yellow pages. Not, yeah, yeah. So I don't think he's met that life goal. Question, how do I get into the book of life? It's a great goal to get into that book. Friend, you've got to repent of your sin and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You need to become a Christian. You need to be born again. You need to be transferred from death to life, from darkness to light. And how you do that is receive Jesus. John 1.12, for as many as received him, to those who gave the right to become children of God. You're not a Christian if you go to a Christian school. You're not a Christian just if your parents are Christian. The person who becomes a Christian is the one who receives Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Number four, Christian citizens have hope in the resurrection. Verse two, let me read it for us. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So the Bible teaches that one day there will be a great separation in the end. Those bodies that were lying in the grave um, will rise up, both Christians and non-Christians. Like they, They will be animated again. They will... They will be like brought back to life. It's the resurrection. So we're not talking about the resurrection of Jesus. There's another resurrection to come. And it says, those in Christ who are dead will rise first. Isn't that interesting? Why do you think they'll rise first? I don't know. I don't have a great answer to that. Maybe they have further to travel. I don't you know. Uh, those who are in Christ will rise first. Those who are not in Christ will not rise up. The others, it says right in this verse, will awaken to shame and everlasting content. We learn that in Revelation 20, that means that one day, those people who have not become Christians will be thrown into the lake of fire along with Satan and his demons. It's recorded in chapter 14, 11. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever And they have no rest, day or night. If that doesn't burden your heart for the lost, I don't know what will. But this truth right here, uh, for the Christian, brings great hope. And it seems really to surface um, very commonly um, uh, on, on people's deathbeds. It's that you're holding the hand of a loved one and you know their end is, is near, and you say, hey, I'll, I'll see you soon. I'll see you soon. Theologically, what do we mean? We mean that, that you're going to die soon, physically, and you will go, we learned this from Philippians 1, that you will go immediately to the Lord. So the soul sleep, you know, where, where it's like someone dies and it's like black and white, just that doesn't exist, Right? They go and be with the Lord and their body goes in the grave. But one day their body will be resurrected and they'll receive a glorified body. And when you say to your loved one, I'm going to see you again, sweetheart, what you mean is I'm going to be able to recognize you. 
But you're not going to look exactly the same. Thank the Lord, right? You're going to, amen. <laughs> you're going to have a glorified body. But I'm going to see you again. And that, like, that brings great truth and joy and hope. That's why death doesn't sting so much when loved one dies. It's a beautiful truth of Christianity. Side note, some of you are wondering, because I know how you're thinking, well, what if I'm cremated? Or, well, what if I got eaten up by sharks in the ocean I got spit out? Um, where's my body then? Or what if I like got vaporized in the ocean? and Right? And that also is a question I don't know the answer for. Um, I, I think the Lord has that under control. I think that He can like bring our parts back, you know, and like, mm, let's move on. <laughs> Number five, kingdom citizens love shining brightly. Kingdom citizens love shining brightly. Verse three, and those who are wise, really cue into this, shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. I know I say this a lot, uh, but I really have never met a Christian who doesn't want to be used by the Lord with their life. Have you guys? You ever met a Christian like, ah, nah, I don't want to be used by God in my life. I would just like it to be wasted away. <laughs> There's no one who says that. And in particular, like especially, every, every believer wants to help someone who's not a Christian become a Christian. I don't think there's anything better in life than helping someone, walking them through the gospel and watching the scales fall off their eyes and, allow, and God opening up their eyes to see the beauties of the gospel, the love of God in Christ Jesus. Is there anything better than that? No, there's nothing better. You can, you can go on a great vacation. You can get a great raise. Those are nice things. But to see someone come to Christ is the best. It is the best. One conversation, friends, can do that for a person. Did you know that? One conversation can change the whole trajectory of a person's life and their afterlife. That's it. Their whole eternal destination can change with one conversation. Let's just dive a little bit deeper, though. How does a Christian shine? Because it's talking about Christians and and shining like stars, things like that. Like, what, what does that mean? So Paul, in the New Testament, he picks up on this language in Philippians chapter 2. And uh, let me read it for you, okay? If, if you were to anticipate um, the answer to this question, how does a Christian shine in, in the universe? How does he shine like stars? How would you start off explaining that to someone? I would anticipate you have the similar, like, Answer is mine. Watch how Paul starts off his, his, um, his explanation of what it means to shine like stars. Ready? Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Oh, my. Can you believe that? I know. It surprised me too. A great way to shine like stars in the universe is not to grumble or complain. Oh, that's convicting to my heart. I know it's probably not for yours. But it is for me, okay? And then he goes on and says that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, parentheses, Babylon, like right now, what you're living in, okay? Check out how he finishes it. Among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. Isn't that good? So what does it mean to shine? Well, one part of it is, is to avoid grumbling and complaining. The other part talks about holding fast. So again, the New Testament gives great light and perspective on the Old Testament. We understand the old in light of the new. 
So what does it mean then to hold fast to the word of life? Two parts to this definition, okay? The first part is, kind of, is, is, is one that like is holding tightly to something or to pay close attention to or in, in some translation says, or to apply the word of life. So what does it mean to shine like stars? Don't grumble and complain, but also to hold tightly to the word So that means to hold fast to it and apply it to your own life. That's what Paul means in 1 Timothy 4 when he says to, hey, watch, to pay attention to your life and your doctrine. So how do you shine like stars and be holy? To hold fast to the Word, pay attention to your life, the rhythms, the patterns of your life, your holiness. Watch it. Tightly. The other is to literally to hold out or to present. That's what it means literally, to present. So what does that mean? How am I supposed to shine like stars in the universe? To present? Yes. That would mean to take the word of life, the Bible, and hold it out to someone else, not just yourself, to present it to someone, to share it with someone. Romans 10 confirms this because faith comes through hearing and hearing by the, by the word. Our mission as Christians is to shine like stars in the universe, not to complain, nothing without grumbling and complaining, and to shine like stars by holding fast and holding out the word of life. Who does the Lord have for you this week? That was my prayer. Even when we were singing that song, to shout it. Shout it from the mountains. Go on and scream it from however the lyrics go. Lord, who would you have me to hold out the word of life this week to? Number six, kingdom citizens treasure God's word. Verse four. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Until the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Let's just look at that last phrase together. Knowledge shall increase. Isn't it crazy how knowledge has increased in the last 20 years? Have you guys experienced that? Like, uh, real quick, in the Bible, there's a difference between knowledge and understanding and wisdom. Like, we're supposed to seek Wisdom, to seek knowledge. Uh, knowledge is described as a knowledge puffs up, right? Knowledge is important. Like, we're not to be Christians that are anti intellectual. Like, you got to know stuff, especially if like, you're working on electricity, right, Ryan? Like, you got to know that the white wire like, connects to the other white wire when you like, put those little caps on it, or else you're in for a world of hurt, right? Just know that. Or else you just look it up on YouTube or things like that. But like that is important knowledge. Don't touch it with your fingers, kids. Okay? Don't stick your finger in a a little plug. It's like common knowledge, right? (laughs) For some, right? But it is really recently that knowledge has, has spiked. And the Bible is telling us this morning that that is a sign of the times that are are ending. It's the, the end times. Like it, it wasn't always the case when you could like just ask Siri anything you want. 20 years ago, people loved playing Trivia Pursuit. No one plays anymore because they just ask Google. They just Google everything. It's a sign that knowledge is increasing. Everyone knows random things. They can research whatever they want. So what should you do? What should you do about this? Like, what does the Christian do in modern day Babylon here? Friends, seek wisdom. How do you do that? Take the words of the book, you apply it to your life. You seek understanding, you hide it in your heart. Why? Because it's eternal, it's not fleeting, it nourishes you, it feeds you. Scripture itself um, 
talks about itself. It says that Scripture has the ability, the, the ability to save. And not just save, but also sanctify. That the Bible has the power to help you grow in Christ. Because the Spirit wrote it. The Bible uses various images to talk about itself. In Jeremiah, it says that, that the word's like a hammer. In James, it says it's like a mirror. Paul calls it a sword. All these things help you grow to be like him and to increase in wisdom. Pursue it, my friends. Number seven, kingdom citizens trust God for the days to come. This is verse five through nine. These verses speak of the times that come. And let me just do kind of a little bit of a summary of the book of Daniel. Some of you, this is your first time ever hearing prophecy taught. You, you, you just thought that was some like Harry Potter thing. But prophet, you, you, like the last 12 weeks, you've heard words like tribulation, uh, the millennial kingdom, the eternal state, the antichrist, right? And you're like, what? This stuff is crazy. Those are all big words. And they sound really scary. And if we're not careful, we could be like, okay, the end times, all that stuff, times of trouble, equal fear in my heart. I don't know if I like prophecy. All I get from like reading chapters 7 through 12 in the book of Daniel is anxiety of the times to come. But let me encourage you, friends. Prophecy does not bring about fear and anxiousness. It brings about trust. Did you know that? It brings trust. This is a mark of the people of God. Uh, next week, we'll be in Proverbs 31 uh, talking about the, the godly biblical woman. Okay, And one of the descriptions of, of a godly woman is that she looks at the days to come and she laughs. Right? That doesn't mean like she's always giggly, but she has, she has a demeanor. She has a posture about herself that trusts the Lord in the days to come. She's not so anxious about it. Because she knows. She has a perspective. And that's what we've gotten through the book of Daniel. We've gotten a scope of the history of time. right From the, 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 from the very beginning to the time of Christ to the church age all the way to when Christ comes back and the eternal state begins. And if you have a scope of what God is like, what He's done, what He's doing now, what He will do, then you can, with context and with perspective, take your circumstance that's happening right now and whoop, place it right in the scope of time and go, you know what? If God can create the world, and if God can end it and bring a new heavens and a new earth, then I think that he's got my math test on Tuesday. I think he's got my relational challenges at work. I think, I think he can hold my marriage together. I think that thing going on with my family, I think he's in control. He's strong enough. He's enough. And I'm going to trust him. Will you do it this week? Will you trust him? He loves to be trusted. He also loves to be told that you trust him. And I, one of my favorite passages is when Peter goes, I believe, <laughs> help me with my unbelief. And if that's where you're there, where you're at right now too, that's okay too. Because God loves it when you're honest with him. Let's go to number eight. Kingdom citizens pursue purity. I'll read uh, verses 10, uh, just 10. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined. But the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. But those who are wise shall understand. So friends, hear this. That purity will be an increasing mark of the Christian 
as the days draw near. Uh, Let me just reframe that so you understand it. Christians will become more and more distinct from the world as they pursue purity with their lives, with how, how they are pure. So what to know um, in terms of my understanding of purity? Like, um, so just to be real with you, when I became a believer and I started growing in Christ, and you know, I, I was in high school, this was my understanding of purity. Ready? Don't do bad stuff. Like, stop it, Newman. You know, and don't, don't like, how does it go? It's don't smoke or chew or date girls who? Right. Just don't do that. And then you'll be pure, right? Um, and, and like, I, I want to be clear. It's like, okay, my mentality was, if I don't have sex before I'm married, then I'll be pure and I'll avoid a lot of challenges. I'll, I'll certainly avoid like, Uh, pregnancy and things like that and I'll avoid STDs and so I'll just not do that because here's the motivation of my heart ready so that my life will be better purity according to Newman high school is that purity no we don't pursue purity because it's just morally good It's because we want to see God. Anyone have their favorite purity verse? Here's mine. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. Good job, guys. For they shall see God. It's so true. If you're not pure, your vision of God will be hindered. It'll be cloudy. It'll be, it'll be hard. But if you're pure in heart, you will see God. Of course, one day you'll see him because you have faith. But right now, you will see him clearly and clearer and clearer and clearer as you are pursue more and more purity. How do you do that? One is you got to deal with your sin. I got to deal with my sin. We all got to deal with our sin. Psalm 51 is a beautiful illustration of a big old spiritual bath. David takes it and he says, Purify me from my sin. Wash me, then I may be whiter than snow. David wanted to be pure before God, to be white inside so that he could see God. So friends, don't be like me in high school. Don't choose purity for moralism's sake. There is a hint of truth in that. If you are pure physically, you'll save yourself from a lot of trouble. If you're pure physically, if you don't have sex before you're married, you won't have a teen pregnancy on your hand. There's some truth in that. But choose purity for Christ's glory. Not just because it'll make your life better, okay? I think, and I would urge you to choose purity because Christ is worth your life your worship, all of your adoration. Is he worth it? Is he worth your affection? Or do you just not want to get in trouble in the future? Do you see the different focus of purity that I'm trying to share with you? Do you see how one is so man-centered and one is so gospel and God focused. Let's do our last one and then we'll close our time together. Number nine, kingdom citizens endure to the end. Here's the last few verses of Daniel. Just look at the last verse with me for a sec. Verse 13, but go your way till the end and you shall rest and shall stand in the allotted place at the end of the days. All right, that, la- that last verse there, here's a Newman translation. Ready? Hey, uh, until you die, and you're going to die, everyone's going to die unless I come back, okay? So this is for you. Until you die, live. <laughs> Sounds pretty simple, huh? You don't need a seminary degree to, to, to understand that one. Until you die, you got to live. What would William Wallace say? 
William Wallace would say, everyone dies, but not everyone really lives, right? I think it's good to point out at the very end of this book that Daniel, he's alive, but he's living. How old is this guy? Really old. He's really old. This isn't a spring chicken anymore. He's not a young buck. This is not him like um, going to the, the, the Babylon palace and going before the king and saying, ah, oh, we're not going to eat that. We're... No, no, no. He was like a teenager then. This is Daniel. We'll say a seasoned man, right? He's old in the faith. His back is probably hurting. And he's living for the Lord. He's aged. And he's being encouraged right here to endure to the end, till you die. To stay faithful to God until you die. Like, don't give up. Live for Him. So here's one of the heroes of my faith, okay? His name's Charles Simeon. Let me tell you a story about Charles Simeon. This brother... Um, in the 1800s, he labored hard in the ministry for 38 years. 13 of those years. 13. 13. Who's younger than 13 in this room? Raise your hand. Exactly. Uh huh. So this guy, for 13 of those 38 years, he was extremely sick. He was so sick that all of his sermons, so 13 times 52, and any time he preached throughout the week, he could only do as a whisper. He had the mentality that he's going to hang with it till he's, till he's later in life, then throttle back in his later years from serving the Lord and just kind of live. And his mindset when he was, when he was going through this was serving the Lord is a young person's game. You know, all this like chair set up and, you know, setting up the speakers and, and, and like, Doing the work of the Lord in the community and talking, that, that's for young bucks. And I've earned my right. And now I'm going to coast for the rest of my days. In 1819, this was his recorded prayer. So he, this is where he committed his life to the Lord and against that mentality of like, I'm just going to let my days go to waste. He said, I vow to spend all of my remaining strength for the Lord. He tells this story in 1819 of his last visit. He went to Scotland. He crossed the border and it says, quote unquote, almost as perceptibly revived in strength as the woman was after she touched the hem of the Lord's garment. So at 60 years age, Charles Simeon, renewed his strength and his commitment to the Lord. And he spent the next 17 years laboring faithfully for his church in the pulpit until he died at the age of 77. He endured to the end. I remember when I was in college, I heard a sermon that really impacted me. It really shaped my, my heart and like transformed my thinking. It's this, this man who was addressing like 10,000 college students, and he brought up this, this news clip um, that recently came out about this couple who retired and moved to Florida. And, it, and, it, and this, the way that this, the language was with this article is that it was like, here's the American dream, people. Like, work real hard because one day you could be like this. And so this couple spends their days walking the beach and collecting, and I remember how he says it, seashells. That's how he says it. Seashells. That's what they do. They collect seashells. College students, live your life for Jesus and spend all your strength and energy for Him. live for seashells. What are you going to do with seashells? Would you vow today to do that? 
the remaining hours, the remaining days, years of your life, would you give them to Jesus Christ? I know many of you, and I know you're Christians. Would you, though, vow to not have one minute of your time be wasted for eternity? That's how this book ends. It's a call to you to live forever for God's kingdom. And guess what? If you do, you won't regret it. You'll be satisfied. The book of Daniel. Let's pray. You are so good, God. You've been so faithful. Your love endures forever. You are so patient with us. You are kind. You're slow to anger with us. And we are forever grateful. Lord, thank you for teaching us through this book. And we need your help. Lord, we want to be determined, resolved. We want to give our lives fully, wholly unto you. Lord, help us to take all of us, all of us, all our strength, all of who we are, all of how you've created us, and we want to surrender it. We want to offer it up to you because you're worth it. We come to Jesus. We see that he did the same thing that he spent his life for our sake, that he died on the cross, he satisfied your wrath, Father. He gave us eternal life to those who believe. Lord, would you, would you help make our lives count for Christ? Show us. Thank you for your spirit that guides us, that brings us along, that carries us like wind in the sails. Would you move in us and through this church for your glory? And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Yeah, would you stand? Let's sing together. While we're singing, would you be praying? Ask the Lord to move in your heart. Ask the Lord, Lord, have I withheld myself from you? How can I serve you more? Let's sing together. Old things have passed away And your love has stayed the same Your constant grace remains a cornerstone Things that we thought were dead Are breathing life again you cause your sun to shine on the darkest night. For all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be our anthem song. Jesus, we love you. Know how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. Jesus, we love you. Know how we love you. You are the have found their hope the orphans now have a hope all that was lost has found its place in you you lift our weary head you make us all instead you took 
up these waves and made us beautiful. For all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be our anthem song. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one on hearts adore. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the You got your one thing, the reason that he brought you, the one thing to receive. I would encourage you get that one thing and share it. Share it with your family, share it with your co workers. When they ask you, How was your weekend? Give them it all. You'll be weird. It'll be worth it. Hey, we love you. Have a great Sunday. If you need any prayer today, any, if the Lord works in your heart, you want to share it with someone and lean on your church. Stay after, go off in the wings, grab a, a community group leader, whatever. We're going to be there to support you.